The UFC returns to Fight Island Saturday, September 26th for another epic championship showdown as two unbeaten middleweights finally go head to head at UFC 253. Having successfully defended his belt against Yoel Romero at UFC 248, New Zealand's Israel Adesanya looks to add to his legacy as middleweight champion and eliminate a Brazilian rising star. I'm gonna f up. I'll see you soon, boy. Paulo Costa's impressive run in the UFC has seen him take out former champions and contenders alike with his vicious punching power. Paulo Costa does it again! And the eraser now has his eyes firmly set on gold and the opportunity to dethrone the last style bender. Only one man will leave Fight Island with their unbeaten record intact. Someone's O has got to go. It's Adesanya versus Costa for the middleweight championship of the world. Hello and welcome to UFC Inside the Octagon Jongen side by side with Dan Hardy. And for today's episode, we're going to be talking about that middleweight title fight at UFC 253 on UFC Fight Island between Israel Adesanya and Paolo Costa. Dan, talk about a fun one to research from all of the trash talking that's been going on to, of course, the technical aspect of this fight. I think it's amazing to see that Israel Adesanya keeps calling out these big guys and he's got another one with Paolo Costa. Well, you know, he likes these challenges, doesn't he? I mean, obviously, he sees Paolo Costa as the other undefeated star in the division and someone that could potentially take that gold as well as all of the hype around Adesanya. I mean, these, these kind of fights are the ones that are tailor-made for Adesanya because he's got someone that's going to come at him, someone that's aggressive, someone that wants to close the octagon down very, very quickly, and he's going to give Adesanya the stimulus that he needs for his counter-striking. You know, it's much more difficult for Adesanya when he's facing someone like Yoel Romero, who doesn't really open up. But with Paolo Costa, what we've seen is someone that's naturally just very aggressive from the get-go and someone that's going to try and take the fight as well as the belt from Adesanya. Yeah, and a wonderful follow-up to that Romero fight because I think Adesanya was left a little frustrated with this one and the fans were left wanting. But we're going to be reminded very quickly about the explosiveness of, of how mixed martial arts can be at the very top end of the middleweight division. Well, let's pull up the facts and the stats then, Dan, because there's a lot to digest with these as well. We see the champion and the challenger. Physically, we see a taller champion. He's also got a massive reach advantage as well. Are they big factors for this? I think they are. I think they are, especially when you consider how uh, Israel Adesanya fights. You know, the, the more range that he's got on his shots, the better. Um, especially if we look back at previous fights and previous knockouts, he's, he's an expert at getting his head out of the way and then punishing what people when they've overcommitted. And, and one thing you can be sure with Paolo Costa is if he misses one of those punches, he's going to be overcommitted because he throws everything into them. So for, for Adesanya, with that reach and height difference, if he can you know, use himself as bait and then force uh, Paolo Costa to miss, even when he's out of Paolo Costa's punching range, he's going to be able to crack him clean with some shots. I mean, eight inches is a massive reach uh, advantage for uh, Adesanya. Yeah. But then at the same time, if Paolo Costa closes him down up against the fence and gives him six inches to work... You know, Paolo Costa's 72-inch reach is looking pretty good at that point. Yeah. Um, I want to just not, not skip over the credentials of Adesanya, but he's obviously on a terrific run, lots of experience. But did anything surprise you about those striking statistics from Paolo Costa? Because they are quite brilliant. Well, they are, absolutely. And, and you, you know, you've got to think the reason why his stats are so high is because of the way he fights. You know, it's difficult to have a high striking rate when you play most of your game out in the center of the octagon because you're going to miss a lot of those shots. The benefit in Paolo Costa being aggressive is that he does take the space away from his opponents. And, you know, as we've seen in his previous fights, he, he does take a punch as well. He takes a good punch because of his yeah. of his muscularity around his neck and his shoulders. He's able to absorb that power as he's still moving forward. Um, so that gives him the confidence to close people down and, and then to, to throw these barrages of shots at them. Uh, and, you know, what we're counting is we're counting shots landed, but they could be landing on anything, including the guard. Paolo Costa doesn't really care. You know, he, he's not really bothered where the shots are landing, aside from the fact that, that he's, he's constantly keeping that work rate on his opponent. You know, when someone's backed up, he then will start looking head and body and those kind of things. But there are still a lot of shots that land on the guard. And that's why his striking rate's so high. But then when you when you hit as hard as Paolo Costa, even the shots on the guard are going to do some damage. 
Yeah, well, they're very different strikers and I'm sure you're going to unpick all of that, Dan. So let's get straight into the analysis then. And, and let's start with the challenger who we assume is going to come forward very, very quickly. But what is going to be his first choice weapon? Well, I mean, coming forward is the safe assumption. I would be very surprised if Paolo Costa does something uncharacteristic and, and he doesn't try and take away as much of the octagon from Adesanya as possible, especially with the trash talking that's going on. You know, he wants to make a big impact in this first round. So if I think Paolo Costa moving forward and backing Adesanya up, I've got to think the safest route of attack for him to start with is uh, going to be those body kicks. So there's a consistency in with, with Costa's style. If he's fighting a southpaw, he throws the power back leg to the open side. If he's fighting an orthodox fighter, he steps through with the lead leg to still work that midsection. He's always kicking the open side of the body. So you can kind of guess which side he's going to be attacking from based on the stance of his opponent. And, and Paolo Costa, given the fact that he's so aggressive and he's got such a high work rate, if he sees you get hurt with one of those body shots, I mean, Gareth McLennan, it was the beginning of the end for him. With, the, with Bamboche, he caught him with that body shot and recognised, he pointed at him right after the kick had landed because he knew he'd done the damage. And then you see the whole posture of your opponent change and that's where Costa starts crashing forward with his punches. But that's why I feel like the body kicks are going to be the start of the attack for Costa because... Even if he's landed on the arms of, of Adesanya, it's much safer than swinging at his head and missing. You know, 40% of his shots land to the body. So investing in that early, attacking the arms, attacking the midsection of, of, of Adesanya, it, it negates some of the slipping and the head movement that Adesanya's got because it's a more stationary target, the midsection. But it also will, you know, it'll put more water in the basement for the later rounds and slow Adesanya down a little bit. OK, well, let's flip it over to the champion then. And I, I think he's expecting a different kind of fight to Romero, a fighter that's going to engage with him. So how does he respond to this kind of onslaught from Costa? Well, I mean, the, 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 the Romero fight was a very frustrating one for him. And it's not a frustration I think he has to face in this one. Uh I expect him to fight very similar to the way that he did against Gastelum and Whitaker, but you know he's got a different kind of animal in front of him. When we've seen when we've seen uh, Adesanya face strikers that kind of get a little bit spooked by his ability to move. I mean, I go back to the Tavares fight. I think about the Marvin Vittori fight. You know, both of those guys, they invested the first sort of 60 seconds in the fight and trying to hit him in the head, and they were unsuccessful. So then they go into this panic mode where they clinch him and hold him. Now, th there are two ways that this plays out. If someone's throwing strikes and missing, they're either going to try and clinch you or they're going to stop throwing those strikes because they feel like they're overexposed. In which case, that's where Adesanya needs to throw a few strikes of his own. And he's got very good long-range, like, defensive striking. Like, he'll pick at the body. He'll work the legs so well like he did against Joel Romero. And he'll gradually break you down in, in, in you know, at the distance. But... The main focus of this, he's trying to provoke you. That, that's what he's trying to do with these shots. He's trying to irritate you and provoke you because he wants Paolo Costa to come crashing forward. He wants Paolo Costa to keep that high striking rate up because from what we've seen from his fights, that's finite. That will run out. And that's when Adesanya starts to take over technically. So in those early goings, especially if Paolo Costa starts to swing and miss, you're going to get an Adesanya that will pick at him from a distance and try and coax him forward so he can then punish him with counter strikes. It's a lot about being smart and not overextending himself, though, because Adesanya doesn't want to get caught up in the mix. The punch that he took from Gastelum in the first round that swelled up his lip, he can't take that punch from Paolo Costa because he, he might not get up. And that's got to be a genuine concern for him. So keeping himself safe in that first round has got to be a key. And I think those long-range picking techniques with his kicks and with his long jab is going to be the, the, the first line of attack for, uh, for Adesanya. Such a high-level striker. It's an absolute beautiful thing to watch him at work. And Costa's going to be facing this. And I guess one of the main ways that you shut down something so pretty is to make things pretty ugly sometimes. He's going to come forward really hard uh, but what makes him so good when he does shut that space down, Dan, and use short-range striking? Well, as you've said, you know, with his with his high strike rate, the reason that the, that the strike rate is so high is because he closes range down and he does make the space very claustrophobic. So if, if you think Costa started the fight, he's managed to back Adesanya up a little bit to the fence, but he's also using those body kicks to slam into the guard and the midsection. And, and force Adesanya into a into a small wedge up against the fence. 
Then what you'll see is Paulo Costa start falling in with his power shots. And I mean, I'll be honest, the left hook that dropped Yo Romero in the first round is the best punch that he's thrown in his career. It was the tightest, cleanest punch, clipped him right on the chin. And, and that is that was a very short range punch. Whenever we've seen him back people up against the fence, what you'll see is his stance kind of squares up a little bit and he gets this nice dig into one side. And, and the, the truth is it's quite basic because he's going, you know, right, left, right, left, right, left, because he's rocking, because he's driving his power from one punch to the next. But because he's got them squared up against the fence, there are only two ways they can go. Adesanya's not going to level change. So he's going to go one or two ways off the fence, which means he's got to go into a left or a right hook as he's moving. And again, because, because Costa's varying his targets from the head to the body, you can't keep covered all the time. This is a drawback to being a taller fighter. I mean, obviously, Adesanya's got longer, longer arms, but he's got a longer body. So there's, there's more real estate for him to try and protect from those targets that Costa's working. And like I said, once he's got you closed down and he's got you up against a fence, you're a captive audience. You've got to deal with those punches because there's nowhere else to go. You either have to clinch him to slow him down or use some kind of trickery to get yourself off the fence, which, I mean, obviously, you know, Adesanya has got, but there's always a risk when, he, when his shoulders touch that fence. Before we go to break, Dan, there's a little footnote that I want to draw attention to for the viewers. It was something that I hadn't really fully appreciated when you look at Paolo Costa's record no straight knockouts everything's no. a TKO uh, and I'm sure that Adesanya will be aware of that do you think that changes the way he respects or doesn't respect the power of Costa yeah I, I think so I think so I mean there's this perception especially from the first two fights that Paolo Costa had in the UFC there's this perception that he's a murderous puncher and, and the truth is he's not I mean He's got a high strike rate because he throws a barrage of punches at people. And everyone that's gone down in a Costa fight, they've gone down conscious. They've gone down covering their head. They've gone down holding their body. He's not putting people to sleep. There's no, you know, you know what I mean? Like, like Israel Adesanya is not going to look at Paolo Costa and think he's going to knock me dead with one punch so I can't get touched at all. It's the volume of Paolo Costa which overwhelms people. And generally when they go down, I mean, they all drop on the floor, but they're conscious when they fall. Which, which is going to give Adesanya a moment. He's going to be able to ride some of these shots a bit better than these guys anyway from his kickboxing record. But there's certainly a, there's certainly a perception that Paolo Costa is far more lethal than he actually is when he starts throwing his hands. And I think Adesanya is going to be realistic about that risk. Right. Okay. Interesting notes. Uh, we have got plenty more analysis still to come your way. We'll be back after this. Welcome back to UFC Inside the Octagon, where we're talking about that main event for UFC 253 between the last style bender and the eraser. What we learned in part one was that Costa's likely going to start this ferociously. He's going to try and back up Adesanya, use big body kicks, and in response, the champ is going to try and keep him at range. Maybe use some leg kicks like he did against Yoel Romero, but Costa's all about trying to close that space and break down his opponents. He loves those body shots as well. But Dan, let's turn it on to the champ once again. An elite striker and what impresses me about him is his patience he knows he can get the finish but he really doesn't matter when he gets the fight wrapped up no that and that is the that is the signal of an elite striker as well because he, he knows he only needs you know he needs a couple of clean shots to get this fight finished and he also knows that he can utilize his opponent's aggression against them you know this is what we've seen in in previous fights of Adesanya's because he knows that people have to close him down because usually he has the reach advantage so he's fighting guys that have got to move into his range and land something significant. So they tend to do it at speed. Uh, I mean, the, the best example really is, is the Whitaker fight because, you know, Whitaker was coming in to defend his belt against this new superstar in the division that was, you know, effectively stealing all of his thunder. And, and Whitaker came in that with some animosity. He came in to try and take his head off. And what we saw from the first round against Adesanya is his ability to just give that space read what was coming to him and allow it just to slip past him without really countering. Because then he's frustrating Whitaker because Whitaker's swinging and missing. And at the end of the first round, what we saw is Adesanya step in and allow Whitaker to throw that big overhand and then just slip out of the way and punish him cleanly for it at the end of the first round. And then as the second round starts, you know, we, we, we saw much the same again. It's, it's allowing his opponents to work. It's making sure he's safe. And then once they've overcommitted their body weight, he's punishing them. And, and with someone like Paolo Costa, when he comes crashing forward with all of that energy and momentum behind him, if he runs onto an Adesanya strike, it's going gonna, it's gonna to 
further increase the power of that punch. And, and as we discussed at the end of the first segment, Paulo Costa is not a murderous puncher. He's a ferocious puncher with a high volume. And it's the volume that overwhelms people. It breaks them down. They, they crumble under that, under that pressure. The, the, the benefit here for, for, um, for Adesanya is that he knows that this stuff coming at him. He knows he can provoke Paulo Costa. He knows he can get him to throw. The more he misses, the more he's going to be aggressive and, and, and overcommit. And the easier that, it, that will be for uh, Israel Adesanya to catch him. And also, as we discussed, because, because it's not one-punch knockouts for, for Paolo Costa, it's the accumulation. There's, a, there's an opportunity for Israel Adesanya to make a few mistakes in this one, to maybe clip, get clipped a couple of times. Because, I mean, you know, if, if you look at his stats, like in, in the round and a half that he faced Whitaker, he took 32 punches. He took 32 punches to measure and to find the, the knockout shot. Against Yoel Romero, all of that, all of that time that he was he was facing Yoel Romero, five rounds, he took forty shots. He didn't find the finishing shot against Yoel Romero, but he also didn't get finished. He didn't get punished for taking too many risks. Whereas if you go back to the Paulo Costa Yoel Romero fight, he took 125 punches from Yoel Romero over three rounds. That's the difference. It was a much more entertaining fight on the Paulo Costa Yoel Romero side but that's because they were both taking punches and landing punches. With Adesanya, he was able to hold Romero off with that, that bit of witchcraft that he's got, the fainting and the, the reading. So Yo Romero really didn't want to commit to anything because he knew he was going to run onto something. I don't know whether Paolo Costa has that same mindset of, well, let me hold back and wait to see what Adesanya is going to do. Most likely is he's not. Most likely he's going to come forward and try and knock Adesanya out, in which case... Adesanya can pick his poisons, choose the shots that he might have to take to keep himself in range and find his own finish. I think the, the, the statement, a game of inches, comes down to it being sort of millimetric precision for the style bender. And he's going to need that against Costa, despite what you're saying, you know, with that one punch knockout power. If he gets you on a roll, you know, it, it could be an, an early night. But let's, let's focus on Costa for a second. And another thing that's impressed me is his evolution, Dan. Because when he first burst onto the scene at The Ultimate Fighter, this guy was a grappler. How and why has this changed so dramatically? I think there are a few reasons for this. I think the first thing is, you know, when he was on The Ultimate Fighter Brazil, he learned a very harsh lesson in that first round where he jumped on someone's back, he had the body triangle sunk in, and he was trying to get that finish as hard as he could for that first round. And then he had nothing left to give. And, and the problem is now, because, because he's not had many fights, the standard is getting much better every time. So the opportunities for him to try his ground and pound, for him to reassure himself in his conditioning, that they're running out. He's now at a stage where he realizes he's got, he's got a gas tank and he can spend that gas tank however he wants it. He can spend half of it grappling to hold the person in position to hit them, or he can improve his boxing where he can utilize that energy system much better. And what we're seeing is that that evolution is his striking skill set. You know, we're seeing him with, you know, with powerful body kicks that then set up his punching barrage. And, and, and it, it negates that need to be wrestling hard. It, that it negates that need to be tiring yourself out, really not getting anywhere other than controlling your opponent. If I'm Paolo Costa and I know I've got a certain amount of energy to give in a fight, I'm going to balance that the best I can. And now, they, now he's stepping up to fight over five rounds. He has to... He has to take into account there's an additional 10 minutes to work. I would imagine that he's still got memories of that uh, Ultimate Fighter Brazil fight where he gassed himself in the first round. If he lost that fight by split decision, what's Israel Adesanya going to do to him with four rounds to work? And I think uh, the other thing we have to bear in mind is Israel Adesanya's takedown defense is getting much, much better. You know, as much as Paulo Costa's evolving and improving as he goes from, from one fight to the next. We're seeing Israel Adesanya do the same thing. Obviously, Adesanya's a, a smart dude. He's coming into mixed martial arts as a kickboxer, so he knows where his skill set is. And he also knows that the majority of people looking at him with that kickboxing, I mean, 75 uh, fights on his kickboxing record, people know what he wants to do in the fight. So when he faces a Marvin Vittori or a Brad Tavares or someone like that, and they spend the first 60 seconds swinging at him and missing, they naturally switch over to a grappling game. And from Adesanya's perspective, he knows that he, at some point he's going to have to defend takedowns. 
to keep the fight in the strongest area of his game. I think what we saw when he faced Brunson is, you know, a, a clear development in his in his takedown defense, which then allowed him to add striking onto the end of it. So Brunson came out as he does in his fights with a wild couple of minutes. He tried to hit Adesanya, didn't work, clinched him, round him up against the fence, and Adesanya is then cruising because he now knows that Brunson's into his into the second half of his game. And Adesanya then does a great job of getting off the fence and getting clear. As Brunson then pursues him, though, you can see Brunson's going to level change. So. The Adesanya making his UFC debut, seeing a level change like this, responds to the level change with takedown defense. The Adesanya that faced Brunson, he switched over to striking instead. Now that to me shows a clear confidence that his takedown defense is good enough, that if he needs to revert back to, to scrambling and getting back to his feet, he can. He decided to, ch to throw a knee in there instead, and he read the angle at which Brunson's head was coming down perfectly. He just he clipped him right on the chin and he had to actually adjust the knee as it was coming in. Because Brunson was covering distance so quickly, as the knee comes up, you can see Adesanya pull his hip back. So he's making sure he's catching Brunson right on the chin as he's moving in. I mean, that to me shows a striker that is confident in his takedown defense, that now he knows that if he needs to get back to his feet, he can. Yeah. Yeah, it's exciting stuff. And to consider that both of these fighters are still evolving and are at the very top of their game is just a, a wonderful thing for us fans to, to get excited about. Uh, I've got some other questions for you, Dan, because of course this is, this is an amazing fight, an amazing build-up as well. The mental warfare. Now, I, I might be off here, but I reckon this might be one of the biggest rivalries involving a Brazilian fighter since we saw Jose Aldo against Conor McGregor. Now, of course, anyone supporting Costa does not want to see the same sort of outcome. Do you think it's even a something that, that might be in the narrative there, that Costa is so kind of angry with Adesanya? He says he wants to hurt him, wants to make him cry, etc., that he comes out flying and then gets caught with something, uh, something super early. It's, it's certainly playing into Adesanya's game, as it did for Conor's game against Aldo. You know, to, to prime somebody before the fight is just like hitting them with low kicks and, and teeps to the midsection in the first and second rounds. He's priming him to rush forward. And what Adesanya doesn't want to do is have to go and find uh, Paulo Costa in the octagon. That's what he faced against Joel Romero, and that's why it was so slow, because Adesanya is a counter striker. And you can force right. people to attack you with, with a multitude of different ways. And, you know, one of them is in the fight using your techniques. But the other one is priming them psychologically before the fight starts. We, we've seen yeah. Costa, Octagon side, you know, yelling at him after fights and stuff. Costa's already animated. He's already been waiting a long time for this fight as well. Because, you know, when Adesanya was fighting Yoel Romero, Paulo Costa knew that should have been him in there had he not been, you know, out for surgeries and stuff. So, sure. There is going to be a there is going to be an aggression in Paulo Costa that I think is going to play into Adesanya's hands, and and again you know we talked about the fact that Paulo Costa he's a high volume puncher he overwhelms people he's not a murderous puncher so this is not for Adesanya this is not a Russian roulette kind of circumstance it's not it's not one punch from Paulo Costa from any angle and you're done like he's he's not got Ngannou kind of power. He's got to land a multitude of strikes on Adesanya, which means Adesanya can allow him to move forward a little bit. It makes more sense for him, as Adesanya being a counter striker, it makes more sense to have Paulo Costa aggressive and moving forward. So then you first think about your own defense and then you think about the counters, but they're already moving onto those counters because of their aggression. Oh, Dan, what a fight this is going to be. Both of these individuals have gifted us fans with such incredible performances in the Octagon so far. Then you add in the ill will they have towards one another. This is going to be special. I know it will be. Thank you, as always, Dan, for your insights. Thank you to everyone at home for checking this out. Keep the conversation going using the hashtag Inside the Octagon. Tweet at UFC Europe. And we will be back for the next pay-per-view. Until then, thanks for watching.